Genesis 7, verse 17. For 40 days, the flood kept coming on the earth and the waters increased. They lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 15 cubits. Every living thing that moved on land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarmed over the earth and all mankind, everything on dry land that had breath, the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for a hundred and fifty days. We know that there was a, that the rainbow represents the covenant that God made with Noah, that he would never do that again, that he would never wipe out humanity via flood, and that he will wipe out via fire in the end. But right now, we have waters that are rising, and God is demonstrating something. And it's very interesting that he has said, as in the days of Noah, that this is the way it will be in the end. And, and of course, he's not necessarily talking about the flood, but he is sending certain things in order to get our attention. And so I want you to think about what does a wicked heart think? A wicked heart looks at these things and, and says, gosh, this is like the flood of Noah, the, you know, what they're doing. But he sent us that rainbow. He covenanted with Noah that he would never send that flood again. We're good. We're in the clear. A righteous heart who has understanding says, you know, God speaks through the things that he sends. And he says that when he sends these things, that his people need to return to him, his people who are called by his name. I also know that he speaks in parable and that there is something that he's speaking in every single thing. And it just so happens that he talks about hail and he talks about rain and he talks about cloud bursts. And I need to take time to perceive what God is saying in what he's sending because he could send anything he wants. So why is he sending this? Psalm 69, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head. Many are my enemies without cause. Those who seek to destroy me, I am forced to restore what I did not steal. You, God, know my folly. My guilt is not hidden from you. Lord, the Lord Almighty, may those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me. God of Israel, may those who seek you not be put to shame because of me. For I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. I am a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my own mother's children, for zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. When I weep and fast, I must endure scorn. When I put on sackcloth, people make sport of me. Those who sit at the gate mock me, and I am the song of drunkards. But I pray to you, Lord, in the time of your favor, in your great love, O God, answer me with your sure salvation. Rescue me from the mire. Do not let me sink. Deliver me from those who hate me, from the deep waters. Do not let the flood waters engulf me or the depths swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, Lord. Out of the goodness of your love, in your great mercy, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant. Answer me quickly, for I am in trouble. Come near and rescue me. Deliver me because of my foes. You know how I am scorned, disgraced, and shamed. All my enemies are before you. Scorn has broken my heart and has left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. And of course, you know that this is referring to Jesus. But the other thing that's so interesting as I'm reading this that occurs to me is, you know, the kings of God's kings we're not really the kings of the world, right? Like this is the king of Israel and this is how he talks. 
God afflicts his people. They are not the kings of the world. And Jesus was definitely not a king of the world. He had nothing that we would desire him. He was not in palaces dressed in fine clothing. He did not have power of the world. These are the things of God. The small things, the foolish things of the world, mocked and spit on, the drunkard, the song of the drunkards. Even the drunkards who are lowly are singing about his pain, his affliction. May the table set before them become a snare. May it become retribution and a trap. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Pour out your wrath on them. Let your fierce anger overtake them. May their place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in their tents. For they persecute those who w- those you wound and talk about the pain of those you hurt. Now let me ask you something. How wicked have we become that we think we're exempt from that? They persecute those you wound. So God wounds his people and talk about the pain of those you hurt. So God sends hurt or grief to his people. Oh, but I see you're supposed to have a comfy life. You're supposed to receive riches and wealth. You're supposed to be comfortable in your body. I see he has a different plan for you. You're not supposed to receive his rebuke. You're not supposed to receive what he's doing and understand that you don't own yourself. You don't belong to you. He's doing something and you're supposed to receive it. And you're supposed to circumcise from the things you want and perceive how he's talking. Charge them with crime upon crime. Do not let them share in your salvation. May they be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. But as for me, afflicted and in pain, you want to be like David? You want to have a heart after God? You're going to be afflicted and in pain. But as for me, afflicted and in pain, may your salvation, God, protect me. I will praise God's name in song and glorify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox, more than a bull with its horns and hooves. The poor will see and be glad. You who seek God, may your hearts live. The Lord hears the needy and does not despise his captive people. Listen, the poor will see and be glad. You who seek God, may your hearts live. The Lord hears the needy and does not despise his captive people. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and all that move in them. For God will save Zion and rebuild the cities of Judah. The people will settle there and possess it. The children of his servants will inherit it. And those who love his name will dwell there. So what has God called us to suffer? How has he called us to live? Because I don't hear David saying, oh, the devil has sent this and I must not be in you. No, he knows he's in him. And he knows that this is part of being in him. And he knows that he must continue to seek God. And he knows also what God has established, that when these things come, when the waters come outside, when the waters come in your life, that you have to go into your house and shut the door and put the blood of the lamb over your door symbolically, rid your house of sin, rid your house of yeast, and you have to isolate and return to him. That's what David understands. And you know how I know that? Because that's what he's doing. Crying out to God, repenting of his sins in the Psalms, remembering who God is and who he is. He is with understanding about his affliction. He is with understanding regarding his role and what he's been called to suffer. Jeremiah 47, this is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah, the prophet concerning the Philistines before Pharaoh and, and attacked Gaza. This is what the Lord says. See how the waters are rising in the north. They will become an overflowing torrent. They will overflow the land and everything in it, the towns and those who live in them. The people will cry out. All who dwell in the land will wail at the sound of the hooves and galloping steeds, at the, sound, at the noise of enemy chariots and the rumble of their wheels. Parents will not turn to help their children. Their hands will hang limp. For the day has come to destroy all the Philistines and to remove all the survivors who could help Tyre and Sidon. The Lord is about to destroy the Philistines, the remnant from the coasts of Kaftor. Gaza will shave their head in mo- her head in mourning. Ashkelon will be silenced. You remnant on the plain, how long will you cut yourselves? Alas, sword of the Lord, how long till you rest? Return to your sheath. 
cease and be still, but how can it rest when the Lord has commanded it, when it has ordered, he has ordered it to attack Ashkelon and the coast? When you see the waters rising in the north, you need to know that they will become an overflowing torrent, that the time is near for the Philistines to be destroyed. What do you need to be doing during that time? Exactly what I just said. Go, my people, enter your rooms and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until his wrath has passed by. Isaiah twenty six twenty. Ezekiel 47, the man brought me back to the entrance to the temple and I saw water coming from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east, and the water was trickling from the south side. As the man went eastward, with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through the water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through the water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through the water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Araba, where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live there, will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi to En Eglum. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea, but the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear their fruit, because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food, and their leaves for healing." There's a distinction here between the marshes. And if you're watching the news and you're seeing where these floods are happening and where the waters are rising, even though we're, you know, we have places that are in drought, like, you know, where I live in California, they're constantly saying that we're in a drought. And so this downpour of water, even though they have, there's water, it's useless water. It's not water that we can drink. It would take forever for them to purify that water. It's marsh. It's swamp. Even to the extent that there's, you know, diseases in that water, there's issues with the water. People have to be careful of the water. It's filthy and dirty. And God talks a lot about water in scripture. He talks about how we're not going to thirst, that we will receive water for free from the well of life. So we need to seek to understand the symbolism of this water and to stop pursuing water that is defiled, water that is disgusting, that comes from a marsh, that comes from a swamp, that drips from the mouths of false teachers and false prophets, because that water won't make you clean. The water that makes you clean comes from the Holy Spirit. It is that water that's going to flow into the salt water and make it clean. But these teachers, these false prophets, their water defiles you. Their water is disease-born. And those who drink of it are going to die. The swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. I just want to give you this word to meditate your heart on, to bring to God, to ask him, how are you supposed to be living right now? What should you be perceiving with what he's sending? Because he uses certain language and concepts with a lot of intention. And we need to be perceiving the ways in which he's talking. A lot of times we get so focused on, well, where are we at? What is he fulfilling right now? And what's next? And tell me what's next, prophet. Tell me what's next. And we chase after these things like if we actually knew we'd even be able to control them or we'd even be able to do anything about it. What we need to be focused on is not only understanding the times so that we know what Israel ought to do, which by the way, isn't going to come from listening to prophets. It's going to, for false prophets, it's going to come from listening to God, listening to his spirit 
And then you'll be able to discern the shepherds he's sent to warn you. But you know what? If you're connected to him, he's going to talk to you personally. He's going to convict you and move you to fulfill this covenant that you have with him. If you're seeking to understand what he has established and you're looking this up in the word, you're going to understand provided that you are connected to his spirit and you're pursuing his heart. Otherwise, if you're just looking in the word so that you can prophesy, so that you can predict, you will be without understanding. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, his heart, and all these things will be given to you. He will give you wisdom and he will give you wisdom freely. Thank you for listening. God bless you and I'll see you in the next video.